we want to visit uh, another of Mark's sandwiches. A few weeks ago, we talked about Mark's sandwich, where he told the story of Jesus and the disciples walking to a fig tree. They looked at the fig tree. Jesus inspected the fig tree. Jesus cursed the fig tree. And then they went to the temple. And Jesus inspected the temple. And he cursed the temple. And then they left the temple and they looked at the fig tree. And the fig tree was completely withered and dead. And the disciples were left to wonder what would happen to the temple. Now we have another sandwich, very similar. And here's a sandwich that starts in Mark 14. Now it was two days before the Passover and Festival of Unleavened Bread. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. We've talked about this a little bit in the past. Uh, Jerusalem, by all uh, re reasonable estimates, was a, a town of between uh, 70,000 and 100,000 uh, most of the year. And then during the festivals, a large group of somewhere between 750,000 and 1.2 million would, uh, would descend on the city. So that would be similar to the population of Austin showing up in Longview. Or, if that's not your side of the state, the population of San Antonio showing up in Abilene. So you can picture how overwhelmed a city would be, and so the potential for riot would really be a problem. When you put that many people into that small of, an, of a place, it would really be a problem. Verse 3 says, Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. It, the, the real translation would be a Simon the leper. It was his, what he was called. While he was eating, and that Greek word is not eating, it's reclining, but it meant to them eating because they ate in a reclined way. One time somebody complained that I didn't do uh, communion correctly, the Bible way, and I said, well, we do it sitting up, that's the wrong way, and they said, no, 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 no. you didn't do it right because you used pre-packaged grape juice. While he was reclining, a woman came in. Now, Mark just says a woman. We know from John that the woman was Mary. Scholars posit that the reason that Mark didn't name Mary is because he wrote in the 30s or 40s, and Mary may have yet been alive, and persecution being what it was, he didn't want to out her. But by the time John wrote in the 80s or 90s, she was probably gone, and so he could make that clear. A woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar, and that Greek word is alabastron, and those are uh, artifacts that archaeologists find all the time. Uh, they still make them in Egypt. I've been to an Egyptian shop where they make these, and, and they make these little round things. There was a problem in the ancient world of keeping things sealed. You know, wine, they talk about in the New Testament, was put in wineskins to ferment, and so the way you make a wineskin, which is either the bladder or the hide of an animal, is you stitch it real tight, right? And, and, and that becomes a, a tight membrane. But to keep things in jars and such, you had to put something on the lid. And these little stone jars would have been made in such a way that they would have had a very narrow neck, and you can find these if you Google them up, and then they would have put the expensive liquid in there, and then they would have put wax on top of that to seal it now getting the wax back out again was a problem without contaminating the stuff so they would break the neck of this little stone and then all of the fluid would come out and if you wanted to make multi-use of course you do it but today when we do that in medical many of you work in the medical field we call that an ampule don't we so this would have been a stone ampule is what it would have been so a woman came in with a beautiful stone ampule of expensive perfume made from essence of, and that Greek word is pure or genuine, nard. Nard is from the spike nard plant. And in these days, spike nard was grown and raised only in India. So this would have been perfume imported in the little stone amulets from India in a caravan, carried across land all the way. It would have been extremely valuable. She broke open the ampule 
and poured the perfume over his head. Now, there are only three times in the Bible where the word nard is used, and this is one in the parallel story, of course, in the other gospel. But the other place is Song of Solomon 112. While the king was at his banqueting table, my nard gave forth its fragrance. Almost seems prophetic now, doesn't it? it, it the essential oils in the, in the Bible, they, we have lots of uh, references to essential oils because anointing was a really big thing for them. It's not so much for us. We do it only because the New Testament told us, outside of a religious context, have you ever seen anybody anointed with oil? In the Old Testament, they would anoint them with oil, pouring oil over their head until it dripped from their beard, is what they said. Not what I would consider pleasant, but okay, they did it, and that, that was their culture. They made a special one in Exodus chapter 30, 22, in which God gave a recipe for anointing oil. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, take for yourself top quality balsam oils, 12 and a half pounds of flowing myrrh, 250 shekels or six and a half pounds of fragrant cinnamon, now it's getting extremely aromatic, and 250 shekels or six and a half pounds of fragrant reed and 500 shekels or 12 and a half pounds of cassia. Cassia, if you've ever smelled it, smells like cinnamon. It's a cousin of the cinnamon plant. So this is really going to be aromatic. And according to the sanctuary, sanctuary shekel and a hen or one gallon of olive oil, you'll make it into a holy anointing oil, a spice blend, a fragrant ointment, the work of a perfumer. It will be a holy anointing oil. You'll anoint with it the tent of assembly, the ark of the testimony, the table and all its equipment, and the land stands and its equipment, and the incense altar, and the altar burnt offering and all its equipment and the basin and its stand, and you will consecrate them. And they will be most holy things. Anyone who touches them will be holy. And you will anoint Aaron and his sons. And you will consecrate them to serve as priests for me. And you will speak to the Israelites saying, This will be my holy anointing oil throughout all your generations. It will not be poured on human flesh. And with its measurements you will not make any like it. It is holy. It will be holy to you. And anyone who compounds a perfume like it and who puts it on a stranger will be cut off from his people. Why the prohibition on mixing up this recipe? And the answer is, God wanted his house to be a beautiful vision, all the gold embroidery. He wanted it to be a place with sounds, the playing of the shofar and all the rest, the prayers of the people. And then he wanted it to be a sensation for the smell. That when you went to the temple, it smelled like the temple. It was a memory device for the children of Israel. So they would know when they were in proximity to the temple, they would remember it. So this woman, Mary, appears at this dinner with a rare imported, imported ampule of extremely valuable uh, oil. And she poured it all over Jesus as a way of honoring him. Now... It went without saying to the readers of Mark's letter that that was normal. It is not normal for us. So it's really hard for us to figure out what in the world is going on there. What they would have also recognized is that while that was a normal thing, anointing somebody, this was a very unusual place to be doing it. At a dinner that you're not the host of, at the dinner table, not the place you do this. So, what do we get from this? Number one, celebrate Jesus in your own way. Jesus has made you unique from all the rest of us. How did Mary Magdalene come to own a $30,000 amulet, ampule? Of perfume she saved up no very likely in her former life it was a gift right so it was a gift from her former life this is the kind of thing that a person who would hire a Mary Magdalene might give to a person like Mary Magdalene 
So she has this laying around. Somebody asked me the other day um, on a survey or something that I was filling out that they said, what, uh, is your, uh, what is your household net worth? And, uh, and it was a little bit embarrassing. And, and I thought, well, I, I'm, I know that I'm exactly a million dollars away from being a millionaire. And, and so what was Mary's how, household net worth? It was $30,000 more than everything else she owned because she had this one thing that was so very, very valuable. What do you have that's so very, very valuable? Maybe we should lavish that on Jesus. Embrace your uniqueness. Celebrate Jesus the way only you can. Don't be ashamed to celebrate uniquely and publicly. And remember, this was not in the temple. This was not at church. She was serving Jesus out in the dinner place, out in the world. The next thing is that we ought to celebrate Jesus with others. She could have done this privately. She could have done this after he left. She could have done this somewhere else. But she did it in front of other people. And we should embrace people who are embracing Jesus and lavishing gifts on Jesus in public. We should be happy to celebrate and share with them, join with them, and encourage them. Verse 4 says, some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. I thought, how insulting is that? Imagine that somebody invites you to Sabbath afternoon dinner and they break out the expensive $15 holiday loaf. And they're serving the holiday loaf and you're loving it. And the child of the host says, Mom, why did we waste this holiday loaf on them? You'd feel a little insulted. It could have been sold, they said, for a year's wages. Experts think that means around $30,000 today. And the money given to the poor. And so they scolded her harshly. You know, sometimes we get so used to things that we lose a context of their value. Back around 1900, a, a writer from Japan named Natsumi Soseki visited England for the first time. And he saw snow on the English countryside, and it looked so different from his home that he was so excited about it, he went to all of his friends and said, I'd like to have a little, a little gathering, a little party, a, a, a snow-watching party. And they all laughed at him and wouldn't come. He uh, later noticed that they weren't too impressed by the moon, and he said, you know, in, in, in Japan, we're very emotional about moon gazing. We'd like to do that. Anybody up? For, no. And then he told this story. He said, one day when my host and I took a walk in the garden, I noted that the paths between the rows of trees were thickly covered with beautiful moss. I offered a compliment saying these paths had magnificently acquired a look of age. My host replied that he soon intended to get a gardener to scrape all this ugly moss away. Don't take Jesus for granted. We have had, most of us, a relationship with Jesus for a long time. Most of us have enjoyed his salvation and the gospel for many years. Familiarity sometimes breeds contempt, and we need to be really careful that we aren't taking for granted what Jesus has done, but more important, who Jesus is. John Ortberg points out that we often fail to recognize how much Jesus' influence has changed Western culture. Children are appreciated because he said, let the little children come unto me. And his followers rescued children who were being abandoned by the Roman Empire. And on and on, so many things that Jesus talked about, the, the nature and stature of women. He allowed a woman to be the first to find him in his resurrected state. A Samaritan woman was his first evangelist. He honored women, and as a result, Western Christians tend to treat women better than most of the rest of the world. He also talked about knowledge. 
and learning. And as a result, it was the Christian church through the Dark Ages that preserved all the learning that had therefore been written down. And they started all the universities, hospitals, making forgiveness a strength rather than a weakness. So don't let's take Jesus for granted. And moreover, I'd say, don't let anything get between your joy for the love of Jesus and you. Don't let your concern for the poor get between you and Jesus. Don't let $30,000 get between you and Jesus. Don't let your work in the church get between you. Don't let your career, don't let your family get between you and Jesus. He replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? So maybe we ought to recognize that when people honor Jesus in ways that are different or unusual or uncomfortable to us, that we oughtn't to criticize him just because it's different. How many of you like macaroni art? Parents, raise your hand now. And yet we display it in our kitchen galleries. How many of you like it when a child brings you a wildflower? Have you ever noticed that wildflowers are always prettier in their natural setting than when they're plucked and handed to you? Here's what Sister White says about that. Christ values acts of heartfelt courtesy. When anyone did him a favor, with heavenly politeness, he blessed the actor. He did not refuse the simplest flower plucked by the hand of a child and offered to him in love. He accepted the offerings of children and blessed the givers, inscribing their names in the book of life. So, celebrate with others who are celebrating Jesus lavishly, even if it's not your style. Verse 7, you'll always have the poor among you, Jesus said, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. Don't hold back. Serve, give, celebrate Jesus lavishly. I, I learned about a custom from another culture. When I went to school here, I went to school with uh, Medium and Martha Valdez. And they lived in Houston. So when I went to Houston, they invited me to their home for dinner. And their father, Dr. Valdez, was the host and it was a very nice experience and he asked me to write something down for me he had handed for him and he handed me a pen and I wrote and I said oh it's a very nice pen he says it is yours apparently it's part of a Latin culture that if someone admires something and it's yours to give you just give it I felt lavished on I know the pen maybe cost a buck but I was lavished on and it was magnificent Jesus is that treasure in the field. Sell everything we have and go buy the field. He is the pearl of great price. Go sell everything and acquire the pearl. Kent Hughes says, Among the tragedies of life are the times we are moved to do something fine or noble and we do not do it. I remember when I got married I was marrying into a very distinguished family, a very good family. Some of you know my wife's family. And at the, at the reception, all the things were going on. Everybody was eating. Everyone was having a good time. Everything was good. And I felt like I should stand up and thank this wonderful family for welcoming me in. But then I thought, oh, it might be awkward. It might be uncomfortable. It might, And I didn't do it. And to this very day, I regret that I didn't thank them. Here's what William Barclay wrote. Love can see that there are things, the chance to do which only comes once. It is one of the tragedies of life that often we're moved to do something fine and we do not do it. It may be that we're too shy to do it and that we feel awkward about it. It may be that second thoughts suggest a more prudent and common sense course. It comes in the simplest things, the impulse to send a letter to someone to thank them for something that they have done, the impulse to tell someone how much we love them and how grateful we are to them, the impulse to give some special gift or speak some special word. And the tragedy is that the impulse is so often strangled at birth, this would be a so much lovelier world if there were more people like this woman who acted on impulse of love because she knew in her heart of hearts that she did not do it 
If she did not do it, then she would never do it at all. How that last extravagant impulse of kindness must have uplifted Jesus' heart. Verse 8 says, She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout all the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed, and like that we have fulfilled Jesus' prophecy. Maybe it should be a lesson for us to tell all the deeds of all the people who have lavishly celebrated Jesus. We ought to tell on each other. And then the other half of the sandwich comes. Here's the other half. Verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot. Remember the first half of the sandwich was these, uh, these guys who were trying secretly to figure out how to eliminate Jesus. And the other half. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come. And they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Have you noticed that nobody ever names their children Judas? What's that, what's that about? This was the last straw for Judas. When he saw this happen in this dinner that night, this was the last straw. Somebody took something worth $30,000 and just broke it. And Jesus had not done a thing to advance the deliverance of the Jews from the filthy Romans. Now, it's an interesting question. So imagine hypothetically just a minute that Mary had come to the disciples and told them what she was going to do. And, and they would have said, Simon, before we begin uh, dinner tonight, we have a little bit of family business that we need to take care of. Um, Mary has uh, in her possession a, a $30,000 ampule of perfume. And she'd like to pour it all over Jesus right now during dinner. All in favor, say aye. Opposed, nay. They would have voted that one down, wouldn't they? Sort of like uh, organs in churches. Had a lady recently talk to Rick and myself, and she played our organ some years ago, and she says, it's a terrible organ. All the organists say our organ is terrible. They all play it, and it sounds great to us, but they say it's a terrible organ. And she says, you got a terrible organ. You really need to upgrade your organ. And I said to her, you know, a decent, good pipe organ costs a million dollars. And she said, well, what else would you spend a million dollars on? And I wanted to say, do you want me to make you a list? Because I have a list. <laughs> million dollar organs, I'm not going to criticize them. The fact is that people who want to spend lavishly on worshiping Jesus... Maybe that's one way to do it. Maybe that's a right way to do it. Maybe that's a good way to do it. But Judas had had enough of this lavishness without Jesus taking any advance toward militarily delivering his people. So here's a caution for all of us. Let Jesus be our Lord and Messiah. No matter how he does it. Even if it's not the way we expect even if it's not the way we prefer. We'll never be able to guess the form that it's going to take. There are a number of contrasts in this little sandwich here. One is the anointing as against the betrayal. Those are kind of opposites, aren't they? Another was the stealth and deceit of the Jewish leaders versus the open, although in an inappropriate place, the open praise of Jesus. And the last is that they're all concerned about the money and we're going to give Judas, 30 pieces of silver, and we're talking about 300 pieces of silver being lavished in love. Our thrift store is actually a pretty good example. So we have a thrift store. Now, I have a lot of stuff at my house. I'm going to be confess that when we decided to rent this house, I was very happy that there was a building out back for my stuff. Now, I keep a lot of stuff because I might need it someday. I don't know about you, but honestly, the might need it someday is so rare. It is so rare that I actually want to have a party whenever it happens. Oh, I knew I would need that someday. 
And about half the time when I say, I have that, I knew I needed it, I can't find it. Right? I wonder if it wouldn't be better to lavish all those things that I might need someday on somebody who could use them today before they become obsolete. Kent Hughes said, Jesus has a lot of strange things in his treasury. Widows, pennies, cups of water, broken alabaster vases. Does he have anything of yours? What do I cling to in my past that I've resisted lavishing on the Lord? What have I withheld from Jesus or Jesus' work that I should be joyfully heaping on to Jesus? It's a question for us to ponder today. I'll pray for us to ponder that. Heavenly Father, just now, we are people of selfishness and greed and avarice, and we confess that. We have many things that we think that we cannot live without, both material things as well as internal and spiritual things, gifts that you have even given us. Please reveal to us the ampules of perfume that would be appropriately lavished on Jesus. And as you reveal them to us, give us the courage to let loose, to invest, to break open, to give joyfully to our Savior. Because we ask it in his name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.